Hey robot makers, hope you're having a good day so far. Let me just turn off that because that's going to really annoy me behind me. So do you want to learn about how to create databases with Python and SQLite? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, so yes, we're going to try and squeeze this in, into an hour, how to create databases with Python. So this is Python, not MicroPython, just out of interest. Uh, so we're going to have a look at what is SQL. We're going to have a look at data and how we store it. We're going to look at why we use databases. Uh, we're going to have a look at relational databases. And then we're going to do some coding, of course. I've got quite a few demos lined up for you, so it'll be uh, more code uh, today. And if you're here for the live stream, we'll also have a bit of a mailbox and Q&A, uh, but that's for the live stream audience only. Okay, let's get into it. So what is SQL or SQL as some people call it? I call it SQL. I don't know if that's... Let me know in the comments what you call it, if, if, how you refer to it. I'm sure people have a very uh, specific way they refer to this. So I call it uh, SQL and it stands for Structured Query Language. So it's a way that we can interrogate databases uh, by using a specific set of keywords. And it's quite old. It was invented in 1970s. So um, by IBM. So two guys at IBM there, Donald Chamberlain and uh, Raymond Boyce, as part of the Project R, as the, they were researching that. Uh, and then it was picked up not, well, about 16 years later uh, by all the uh, standards bodies. So the ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, and also the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO. Uh, and then in the 80s and 90s, it really gained popularity as the uh, the the language of choice for all of the uh, relational database management system vendors, such as Oracle, IBM, Microsoft. Um, and there's also other variants of this as well. You might have heard of MySQL or MariaDB um, and also PostgreSQL. So they all use, or they can all use SQL or some kind of dialect of that. So it remains this sort of pr um, predominant language uh, for working with relational databases. So we're going to have a look at how to create our own uh, SQL queries shortly. So what is SQL3 or SQL Lite 3, I should say. So this is a an embedded database. So it's actually something that you can use in a lot of your code. And in fact, if you've got an Android uh, phone or an iOS phone, you actually have loads of SQL Lite 3 databases on your phone, whether you know it or not. Things like the Contacts app, the Photos app, they all use this in the background to store their data and make it really easy for programmers to uh, take that data out and filter it and so on. So it's an embedded database. Uh, it's public domain, so anyone can use this. It's free. You can use it for any purpose you like. Uh, there's no kind of limitations from a commercial perspective. It's ACID compliant, uh, which is a standard for uh, doing sort of atomic transactions and so on. You can Google that if you want to know more about ACID. And it's cross-platform compliant, so um, or compatible. So you can use it on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, Android, and so on. It supports the full SQL language uh, and it's widely adopted. So there's, like I said, lots of uh, embedded devices use this, Internet of Things devices and so on. It's also really efficient. So that means that we can use it with very larger data sets on smaller devices, maybe not microcontrollers, but certainly on smaller Linux computers like the Raspberry Pi, for example. And it's very extensible. We can add to this, make it to have more functions and capabilities. And it's currently being actively developed as well. So uh, this means that it's current, we can use it and we can rely on that future uh, development as well. So this is what we're going to be using today in our Python uh, database creation. And before we do that, let's get into a tiny bit of database theory just to set the context and to make this all make sense. So if you look at the hierarchy of, uh, of knowledge, wisdom, information and data, uh, we start at the very top. Maybe we should flip this over. So data is machine readable. It's raw facts and figures. So, for example, the value 21 could be uh, a piece of data. And without actually having any meaning associated with it, that value is just 21. Could be anything. So information is where we process this data and it's human readable. So we might give it some meaning. So it might be 21 degrees uh, and that might be a temperature measurement from a sensor. The next level is knowledge. And this is where we look for patterns and trends and meaning and comprehension and interpretation of information. So we might, for example, say it's 21 degrees in this room uh, and that means something. We might also say that it's 21 degrees as an oven temperature and we can we can interpret that in the next level, which is wisdom. So wisdom involves the application of that knowledge and experience to make sound judgments and decisions. So if we know that uh, an oven is 21 degrees, we know that that might be a 
cold oven and we need to sort of whack up the temperature to like 200 degrees to cook our our food whatever we're cooking in there uh, so lots of different levels of information uh, and starting with raw data and for our database we're mostly looking at the data side and a bit of the information side we're, we're putting it in a format that can be interpreted by people and then hopefully what we get out the other end is some knowledge and wisdom where we can get some insights into that data we can see some patterns so that hierarchy um, as i've just sort of said there i should have gone to this slide really Data is the raw facts and figures. We sort of had that temperature sensor value. Information is uh, processed information. So it could mean that's degree C. And then we've, we've, we've talked about knowledge and wisdom as well. So I should have gone to that slide really, shouldn't I? Um, so storing data. In Python, this is how we typically store data. We have a variable and we store some um, information in there, such as like my name, my age, my favorite number. Uh, and if I'm happy is a true or false, it's a Boolean value. And I've picked these four different things because they have different types, don't they? So uh, a name is a text string, uh, uh, an age is an integer, it's a whole number. A favorite number is a floating point number and is true is a Boolean, it's a true or false. So when we store things in Python, that's how we do this. When we store it in SQL, we are in databases, I should say, and access through SQL. They usually have different types. So integers still the same, that's still a whole number, uh, but strings as we call them in Python become text. So text can be any, any length of alphanumeric characters. They're a string. A real number is what we would normally call a floating point number in Python. So again, 3.14 could be a real number. And then we also have this uh, type that's called date time. So we can have timestamps in there and we can do all kinds of comparisons between dates and times in there. And then we have this other thing, which is just kind of everything else. Everything else is a blob. It's a binary large object. So it needs some interpretation. And this is usually for storing things like images or video or whatever. It's just a great big uh, blob of data. It can be also considered quite poor um, best practice. It's like worst practice to store lots of data in blobs. But um, you know, your mileage may vary with that. So why do we use databases? What's the purpose of this rather than just storing things in like um, a flat text file or a binary file? And it's to do with data organization. So databases are like filing systems of information. They can help us sort into categories so it's easy to find uh, and, it's, and it's quick to find as well. They also do this thing called data integrity. So we can have rules in our database that en enables the data to remain accurate and reliable. And we'll get into some of that later on when we talk about like primary keys, foreign keys and constraints. They're the sort of rules that we can put in place. We can also have a layer of security on here. So we can say that this table of information here is private and you have to be a member of a particular group to lock that down. Now, we're not going to look at that too much today, but that's a feature of databases and that they're also scalable. So we can start out with a very small database like we've got now, and then you can scale it out to billions of rows of information. Uh, so databases can handle that kind of uh, growth there. And then the consistency means that we can have many people accessing the data at the same time. So a database management system will help that kind of thing. So when you do your search on, on Google, for example, many people can do that at the same time. It doesn't just have one person accessing that at once. So that's what a database will enable us to do. So if you like what I do and you want me to make more of these videos, uh, it's a quick plug. Give me a like on this video. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything and it means the world to me. Drop me a comment. Let me know what your favorite database uh, is. And if you've not already subscribed to this channel, which most people haven't, I think only about 30% of the people who watch this subscribe. If everyone who subscribed to this, uh, everybody who watches this subscribed to, I would have over a million subscribers. So help me get to that number. <laughs> it means the world to me. Okay, and I do go live every single Sunday at seven o'clock um, UK local time. So we're still currently in British summer time. So that's uh, seven o'clock. Um, and I do that every single week with a new topic. So let's have a look at relational database management systems. So we're going to look at multiple tables in a database. So databases don't just have one table of information. And we're going to have a look at a table in a minute. They can have multiple tables that are all interrelated in some way. So relational databases are the most common type of database used today. That might be arguable. There are quite a lot of uh, non-relational databases that are used for very fast uh, access to data, things like Redis, for example, uh, and also uh, InfluxDB for doing time series data. But I think generally in business world, relational databases are most common. Uh, 
And they organise data into tables, rows and columns. And we establish relationships between those tables, such as this one on the right hand side. So we can see we've got a person, that's a table, and a person may have one or more hobbies. So there's a hobbies table and there's a country table and um, there's a relationship between country and person. So one, a person lives in one country, but a country may have many people. So those little crow's feet that we have at the very bottom there, those sort of like three, trying to do the three thing, uh, that represents like a one to many relationship. Um, so understanding these relationships is critical and crucial for working with uh, databases effectively. So let's have a look at a table. So a table is the fundamental building block of relational databases. It consists of rows of information. So on our thing there, the green and blue stripes are our rows. And we also have our columns of information, such as the name, age, location, favorite color. And the table itself has a name, such as this one is pets. Um, so for example, we have um, a library database that might have a table called books and that might have information all about books and each row would represent a single book and each column would represent some piece of information about that book such as the title, author, year of publication. We'll do that in our demo in a minute. We're going to have a look at this. So rows, like I said, are going um, left to right. They are individual records and they represent a single entry in our database. Uh, so each book would be a single row. And to insert data in our in our table, we'll use the SQL insert command. We'll have a look at that in the demo in a second as well. So these statements specify the values for the um, for each column in the table. Um, so column wise, columns represent the individual fields within the table. So each column has a excuse me a specific data type. Remember, we're talking about data integrity. Uh, this is like. Um, a bit unlike a spreadsheet actually where each cell could be a different type in databases a column every piece of data that's in there uh, in that column is of the same type so it might all be an integer so ages are always going to be a number um, the uh, name will always be a text field and so on if you have like date of birth that would always be a date column type as well and also notice on the very left hand side there I've got this special column that's called an ID column uh, and that's the primary key so each record has a unique number uh, and in this case these are auto incremented so each number goes up one that's not always best practice because it can mean that people can hack databases if they have a record number they know that there's a, a record lower than that number if it's auto incrementing so that kind of approach has gone out of favor a little bit we now have like a random number a very long random hash key instead but this is a very simple way that we can do it in simple databases for embedded systems um, primary keys are also mandatory in this particular table so we have to have one and it auto increments so it's a very nice simple system uh, for creating a, un a unique number for each record so it just takes the last one and adds one to it so we talked about constraints this is how we make our data have data integrity uh, and the types of constraints that we can have in sql lite we can say it's not null so that means that it has to have a value it can't be empty so if we had um, a book for example the book would have to have a title we couldn't leave that um, empty so by saying a uh, name is not null when we create the table that means that we always have to have uh, a name in there and if you try and pass a record to be created without a name it will reject it and that's how we can maintain that integrity we can also say that's unique across all the records in the database table um, and that's like the primary key for example that's always going to be unique and we can also have a default value we can specify uh, if no value has been passed in then we could have for example no title given uh, as a default value and then finally we've got that primary key which identifies the column as being unique um, across this table so each each record is unique because of that primary key so we're going to have a look at that when we create our table uh, in the demo in a second as well now primary keys have um, a cousin which is the foreign key so foreign keys in one table relate to a primary key in another table and that's how these relationship links are formed so for example we have that person and hobby uh, so a hobby has a foreign key that it relates to the primary key of the person so each hobby would have a primary key that links to that person and that means when we're searching through our databases we don't have to have the person's name we just have to have that um, that reference number that uh, foreign key and we can find all instances of that foreign key and then it will be able to by the magic of relational databases um, provide that you that name or whatever we want to have that link to um, come back in the query we can have a look at that um, in the demos in a second so foreign keys and primary keys relate to each other 
Okay, let's code, shall we? Let's get into this and uh, create some code for ourselves. So let me just get my notes up here. Uh, there we go. So what we're going to do, we're going to create by um, we're going to create a database, uh, and the really cool thing is, if the database file doesn't exist, it will create it for us. This is one of the really cool features of uh, SQL Lite. And what else we're going to do? Um, we're going to create it called uh, my database .db. .db is the standard for SQL Lite databases, and we're going to create a, a, t a table that's called books. Uh, and we're going to cr create some entries in there as we go along. So let's get over to um, Visual Studio. Let me just grab that there. And I've got this ready for us to start. So the first thing we're going to do is import SQLite 3. Now, the really cool thing is you don't have to install anything. You don't have to do pip install. This already exists. It's um, a built-in library for Python. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a connection. And we're going to say uh, SQLite 3 connect to, and then we've, we called it my database. DB. So if that doesn't exist in the current working folder, um, then it will create it. So I'm just going to make sure that we haven't got something in there already. Let's have a quick look. Let me just remove my database so that doesn't exist. OK, so that's how we create a connection to our database. And then what we're then going to do is we're going to execute. I always think that sounds like very, very serious and very... Uh, very dark, we're going to execute a command. So we could put everything into some um, speech marks like that, um, some quotes like that, for example. However, if we do three speech marks, we can actually break this down across several lines and it just makes it a lot easier to, uh, to code. So if I do um, lots of speech marks like that, I can then do this create table if not exists and then let's call it books. And then we need to give it um, some columns. So we, we want to have that unique ID, which is going to be our, our primary key. We're going to auto increment that. We can have uh, the title, which is going to be text. I uh, just need to put a comma after that. Um, and then we say that the author is also a text. And then maybe that the year that this was created is going to be an integer. And that's what we want to be able to execute in our SQL statement. OK. Once we've done that, we want to uh, commit this to our, our file. Um, so what we need to do next is do a connection.commit. And then finally, once we've finished with our database, we're going to close this down. So I'm just going to put a little comment above there just to say that this is going to uh, write the data to the file. And let's have another one, which is uh, close the database connection. There we go. So if we run this, it's not going to do an awful lot, but it will create that file. So if I do that, oop, let me see what I've done there. I've not, I've typed connection wrong. So it should be connection dot execute. There we go. Let's try that again. And let's just click off that, click run. And what's it complaining about this time? Uh, nope, it's, it's not complained. I think it's actually run. So I'm just going to do clear. Make sure that's not having any errors. No, it, it has got an error line five. So what's it unhappy with there? Uh, so it's saying incomplete input. So let me just check what's going on there. Ah, I've not, I've not closed out the SQL statement with a, a bracket. So let's just do that like so. Let's try running that again now. Okay, that looks like it's uh, run okay. I'm just going to clear my console down here and just click run. And if we now just do an ls command, I can see that that my database file exists. So we've created a table. There's nothing in the table yet, uh, but we have created that blank database using this this uh, set of commands. Right. So what we're going to do now, we'll go back to our keynote and we're going to have a look at what we want to look at next, which is so that was demo one creating our database. Um, so what we want to do next is insert some data. So the way that we do that, that little snippet on the right hand side is the SQL statement for um, inserting data. So we say insert into the table name books and then in brackets, we pass it to the, the um, column name. So title, author, year, and then we say brackets, sorry, then we say values and then we pass in the actual values. So where we've got those question marks, that's where we're actually going to pass in the title, the author and the year. And once we've done that, it'll add an extra row. So let's do that. So let's go back to Visual Studio. Oops. And let's add to our our demo. So let me just get my notes ready there. 
So after we've done that connection thing, we're going to create a new couple of lines. So let's insert some data. Uh, insert data into the table. I'm going to say books data equals. I miss something. Let's turn off Alexa. Can you say it again? How do we turn that off? There we go. Got Alexa next to me and it was just listening again. It was saying, I can't find any information on that. Right, so we're going to create a list. And in this list, we are going to create um, some records. So let's do um, some brackets and yeah, I like that. Let's let's have that. So we've got a title, we have an author, and then we've got a number, which is the year. Let's have some more examples of that. I'm just going to let uh, Copilot suggest some books there. Let's do a few of them like so. No idea what these uh, these books are, like the, the Python ones. Oh, that's all good. Uh, so that's the, the data. And then what we then need to do is uh, insert that, that uh, data into our database. So let's do um, a connection.execute. Now we want to actually execute many. So this execute many is going to allow us to execute many commands at once. Let me just put that in there. So let's type in that SQL. So it was insert into books, the title, the author, as it says there, the year, and then the values are going to be, and we do that uh, question mark thing. And if I just scroll up there, we can then pass in that books data list and it will break down because it understands that each one of these things in the list has three separate values and it will populate them in its little list. So if we now run that, we've now inserted that. Now, you might not believe that that's actually happened. So I'm going to show you a piece of software that's called DB Browser for SQLite. So if I go over to this DB Browser for SQLite and I open up that database, there it is. I can see that I've got um, a books table and the books table has an ID, it has a title, an author and a year. And if I go to browse data, I can see the titles that are in there, I can see the author and I can also see the year as well. And I think the reason it's got these spaces in between it is because it's actually stored as Unicode and Unicode takes up two bytes. So it just looks like it's got spaces in there, but we don't need to worry about that. The data that we've inserted has been inserted, which was really cool. And it's also automatically created the ID and automatically auto in incremented it in value as well. So I'll send up, there is actually a link to this tool um, in the tutorial that goes along with this. And I'll show you the, the links to that. The links to the tutorial are in the video description. So that's where you want to find that. So that's what we've done. We've created some uh, information. We put it into our file, but we now need to be able to get that back out. So let's go back over to here. And we're now going to look at demo two, which is, um, sorry, demo three, which is retrieving the data. So we're going to do this with a select statement. So if we do select star from books, that will say, give me absolutely everything. Star is a wild card. It means give me everything. Uh, and it's usually quite a bad practice. You should specify what you want back, such as the title, the name uh, and the author, for example, and the year. But in this case, we're just going to say, give me everything. The reason it's bad practice is if this was like a billion row database with thousands of columns and you say, give me everything, you'd be there for quite some time and it would tax the database server as well. So it's generally considered bad practice. But for what we're doing, don't worry about that for now. So the code retrieves all the data from the books table using the select statement and stores it in this variable that's going to be called data. So we can then interrogate it. We're going to then look through this data one row at a time and tease out all the information that's in there. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Let's go over to um, creating this now. So this is demo three. Let me go over to Visual Studio and we'll continue with our uh, building up our program. So after we've done that executing for inserting the data, we are then going to query the data. So let's uh, uh, query the, uh, the query data from the table. OK, so what we're going to then say is we're going to say result equals connection dot execute select star from book. So that's going to give everything that's uh, in that database table and it's going to put all the results as a list inside results. So if we interrogate that, so if we say data equals result dot fetch all. 
that will actually get all that information and put it into data from the results. And then what we can then do, just to print this out, we can then say, um, let's just say display the data. And for each row in data, we can say print. And let's say um, if we do an F string, that means we can put some nice um, variables in there. So a title is and then row one. So we're passing in here the current row that we're on. The first column is going to be the, the zeroth column is the ID. The first row is the title. So if we now do print F and then off author, oops. There we go. And then if we do the third one, which is year, and then finally, let's just print a blank row. And I'm gonna run this again now what do you think will happen because we've still got that insert into our database so when i click run let's see what's happened in the output here let me just move this up and you can see there it's printed out um, the title is the pragmatic programmer by andy hunt uh, 1999 the next one is the the first python by paul barry 2010 and so on and then it's got the second um, it's kind of got two lots of data in there if we go back to our database browser and we refresh this we've now got six sorry we've got uh, 10 rows because we did that insert twice so if we want to keep running this program maybe we should um, comment that out so that we don't keep inserting more and more into there so if i just comment that out that'll stop that happening in the future uh, but there we go so we can now run this and we can see that we get all the results back Okay, so let's get back over to Keynote and see what our next one is about. So that's how we retrieve data. We're going to sort the data next. So maybe we want to be able to get, um, uh, let's have a think of a different example on this one. So we're going to, we're going to have some employee data for this next uh, database example. And we want to sort it by the age of the employee. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a small program very similar to what we've just done. We're going to have an employee table and we're going to have about 10 different employees that have different ages in there. And then we're going to use that select star from employees order by the age, which is the field we want to order it by. And the ASC means ascending value. We can also have the descending value. Uh, I think that's DESC, uh, but a uh, ASC is like a short form for ascending value. So it'll increase in value. Okay, so let's do sort of like the largest one first, I think that means. Okay, so let's create this program. Let me go back over to Visual Studio and let me go full screen on that. So let's create a new file. What we could actually do is just duplicate this one. Let's just copy and paste. And let's call this one a demo. I'll call this demo four because it's sorting data. And let's just hide that. So we're going to keep it called my database. We're going to use the same file for this. We're just going to create a new table. So this time we're going to create one that's called employees. Employees. And we're going to have a primary key, which is fine. We then want to have a name, which is going to be text. We're going to have an age, which is going to be an integer. And we're going to have a department. A department and that's going to be a text like so and then when we insert this data into the database we're going to actually call this uh, employee data instead employee data and let's just create some employee data so hopefully um, there we go we've got copilot helping me type some things in there so lots of uh, Lots of people call Doe. Let's let's create one that's not Doe. <laughs> let's have Charlie um, from not Charlie Doe, just Charlie, and he's from he's twenty five and he's in HR. There we go. Let's see if it'll create some extra ones now. Let's have uh, Eva. I just want a couple more of these. Oh, there we go. Samantha for marketing, engineering, sales, marketing, Mark. <clears throat> right, that's probably enough for now. We've got quite a few records there. Okay, so next is the inserting part. So let's go over here and make sure that that will insert into employee. Into employees. And we want the 
the ID. Now, did we specify an ID? We didn't on there. So let's have a quick look. So we've said ID is auto increments. That's fine. So we don't actually have to pass in the ID. That can be automatic. So then we just need the name. We need the age and the department like so and then we want to pass in instead of employee books this time it's going to be employees employee data okay so that's going to give us what we need there we're then going to have a similar kind of uh, so instead of select staff from books it's going to be select staff from employees the employees and we want to then say order by age ASC like that ascending order so then we can then say data equals fetch all results and then we can print that data out so um, so instead of being, being titled be name age and department and that's rows one two and three that's fine so let's see if this will work I might save that and then let's run this uh, so I've typed a employees wrong there. Let me just correct that. Let's rerun that. Okay, so we've inserted all that data into there. And if you look at the ascending order of the ages, so we have Chris who's 23, Sally's 23, Jane is 25, Charlie's 25, 27. So you can these, see these are going up in order. So we can actually change this now to be descending order. Let's try that. And we now get... Um, oldest person first so if we scroll up to the top there so Fred Doe was 45 then we've got Mark who's 40 and then I think there's two lots of these people because I've just rerun it and inserted the records again so there we go right so that's how we uh, can sort information that's a very very simple example of ordering the information there but you get the idea uh, and just to show you again the data actually itself uh, if we go up to the table here we've got uh, if we go to database structure and we just give that a refresh actually refresh uh, we've got a new table that's called employees and we can see the structure there we've got ID name age department and if we look at the data and browse that we can see that oops, if we go to the employees data that we have a lot of people there so there we go and you can see that the age uh, is just as we entered the information in there so what we could actually do is we could probably get rid of a few of those records that are extra there just to um, just to tidy this up a bit. But I'll show you how we can actually do that in Python rather than using this tool to delete things. Uh, so let's now go to our next demo. We want to do something a bit clever now. We want to do some students and courses and do a relational database. So that's sorting data. That was our demo for. So we're now going to look at how to use the join function. So in this example, we're going to have two tables, student and course. And a student table contains all the student information, their ID, the name, the age. And then the courses table will store all the course information. So the course ID, the course name, and the ID of the student who's enrolled in that course. So this is, the, we can see on our little diagram here, this is an entity attribute relationship diagram, an ear diagram. And this shows us a student and course. So this thing here means that there can be many students in a course but each course relates to one student. That's what that particular, um, maybe that should be the other way around where we have one course as many students and a student is in one course, but uh, it doesn't really matter for the for what we're doing here. And then we can see there the two tables, we've got students and we have course. We've both got primary keys, um, which are unique to that table. And then we have the individual records for the students there and the individual records for the courses. Now the student ID, so for each one here, so student ID record one means that row there, Alice 18. Science, we have student two is Bob 19. And then student ID three is Charlie, who's 20. So these are the foreign keys to the primary keys in that table there. 
So that's what we're going to do. Now there's actually lots of different types of join that you can do. Uh, so here's a summary of a few of the join types. Uh, if you want to have a look at this, you can find this on the course that goes with this as well. So you can print this out. But effectively we have lots of different types and think of them as like two intersecting Venn diagrams. Um, so a left join would be uh, everything that's in table A and anything in table B where it actually matches up. So there might be two things that are the same in both of those tables. So only give me the things in everything in A and only those in B that match. Uh, a left outer join is only the things that are in A and are not in B. Uh, and similar, we have uh, everything that's in B and not in A. And we have another one which is the opposite of uh, the left join. We have the right join. And then we have the, um, the inner join. So only the things where the two tables intersect, where they've got the same values mapped there. Uh, and we can have a full outer join where we say, give me everything from A and everything from B, uh, but nothing where they overlap. So just give me the unique values for each of those. And then we have full join, which is just give me absolutely everything. So there are all the different scenarios that you can have uh, and all the different types of select statement that are for each of those as well. With a bit of an example there. So like I said, that's going to be on the, the course that I've, I've got a link to in the description. So let's have a go at that, shall we? So we're creating some related tables. So let's go back over to Visual Studio. Let's create ourselves our new file for this one. Uh, let's just call this one, uh, let's just save it as demo, this is gonna be demo five.py. Okay, so let's just uh, crack on with this. I'm gonna say import SQLite again. I'm gonna do our connection equals uh, SQLite connect to my database that we did before. I'm going to do the connection dot execute. Let's just move that in a bit so we can see a bit better. Execute. And then we're going to do those uh, three speech marks again so that we can see what we're doing a bit better. And let's do create table if it doesn't exist. And this is going to be students. And there is, there is a, a, another theory. I'm going to type students here, but really the table name should be singular. So it shouldn't be students, it should be student without the S on the end. But f we'll just go with this for now. There's a, there's a reason for this. Um, and it's just be, to do with people being uh, very particular. So we'll have name and that's text. And then we'll have age, which is integer. Uh, and that's that one. Then we need another one, which is execute. And this is going to be for the courses table. So let's create the courses if that doesn't exist. We have a primary key. We're going to have the name. We're going to have the uh, the student ID, and we're going to have a foreign key. So a foreign key is the student ID, and that references the student ID um, in the student table up here. So that's going to reference that one up there. Let's just move that down a bit. Okay. We now need to insert some records. We've only got a couple of records to insert, so this will be nice and easy. So students data equals. So let's <laughs> let's go with um, so John is going to be eighteen. We're going to have uh, Bob. Oops, Bob, who is going to be nineteen. We're going to have Charlie. He's going to be 20, that's fine. Okay, we just need to close that list out there. And let's also have the course data. So we're going to have um, math. That's going to be record one. We're going to have science. It's going to be two. And then we're going to have history. It's going to be three. There we go. Okay, so now what we need to do is insert those records. So let's do insert students from the student data. And we're also going to do the same thing, insert the courses. So the name, the student ID, the values into the course data. Then what we want to do is we want to say results equal connection.execute. And then we want to say 
Um, let's see, let me do this as those three. Like so. So let's say select student's name and the course name. And then we say that and the, the way that we normally do this is each line has something like it has the keyword that we're going to use select the table names and the field names. The from is which tables we're going to pull this from. And then we're going to do the inner join, which is going to be inner join courses on student ID where student ID equals the course dot student ID. So does that make sense? We've got the student table that has a primary key. We have the courses, which has a foreign key, and we want to relate the student ID and the courses foreign key together. So where they're the same, we're gonna have that inner join. Um, so let's do that. And then we're just basically gonna commit to that. So let's uh, close that out. Oops, just put that over there. And we're then going to do connection.commit. Why does it keep putting everything over there? Come back over here. Connection.commit. And then let's just do a little loop that says um, student. <laughs> student uh, course relationship. relationship there we go so for row in result dot fetch all and then for each row we're going to say print i think it was results wasn't it results we're going to say print student and then the course that they're in which is course row one okay and then we're going to connection.close. Okay, let's run this and see if I've got any typos in there. Yes, I have. So it's saying that there's an incomplete. Um, where is that incomplete? So that's in row five. That's right up there. And again, it's just the, the closing bracket. I always forget that off there because we have a, a bracket up here. I always forget to close that. Right, let's try that. Um, line 13's got the similar thing, but it's the same issue as well, but I've just not closed that bracket. There we go. Perfect, right. So I've run that and we can see there we have course relationship. So John Doe is on math. We have Bob who's on science and Charlie is on history. So if we go back to our database browser, we can have a look in here uh, and see what's going on. So if I go now and just refresh this, we can see that there's now a courses table there is a students table and when we run that query we can then in fact what we can actually do if I go back over here and I grab that um, that SQL query there let's just grab that in its entirety I go back over to our DB browser we can then go to execute some SQL and we can paste that in and then we can run it and what we get back there is exactly what we got back on our Python example. So you can see there that the SQL runs exactly the same in a completely different SQL uh, piece of software, a different tool. So you can see they've got John Doe, we've got Bob, we've got Charlie, Charlie's history, uh, Bob is science and John Doe is math. And if we go back over to our Python example, you can see there it's the same John is math, Bob is science and Charlie is history. So the joining works. Okay, let's go back over to our keynote. And let's see what we've got next. So deleting data. So this is a really important thing that we need to be able to do. I'm just going to quickly check my uh, my slides. Yeah, so let's go and do some deleting of data. Let's go back over here. And this is very simple to do. So we're going to keep, let's go back to our books example. Um, so that was this one, I think, was it? That was employees. Let's go back to our books one. Right, so what I'm going to do um, I'm going to get rid of some of that code. So let's see where we would need to do that. So just after we've connected to our database. So in fact, let's just create a new one. Just easier. 
and clean it. So let's do that. Let's call this one demo six. Okay, so let's just do import SQL light again. SQL light three. Uh, we're going to do the connection, which is to my database. Now, what we want to do is we want to delete a specific book by its ID from the books table, like so. So let's say book ID equals. Uh, now let's just go and check on our database browser just so we can see an example. So if I go to browse the data, go to our books table. Uh, so table uh, record one is the pragmatic programmer. So just bear that in mind. We're going to go back to our code. And so book ID is going to be one. Book ID to delete is going to be one. We're then going to do connection to execute delete from books where ID equals and it's going to be the book ID to be deleted. We can then do connection dot commit to save that data to our database and then we can also just have a quick check to see um, select star from books print books and then we can say for row in result dot fetch all and then we can print out the the title in fact we can probably do that on one line actually let's make that a bit more efficient let's say title um, and there we go. We don't actually need that new line on there as well. So let's do that. Let's run this and see what happens. So it's now listing all the books. So the pragmatic programmer, which was our first one, has disappeared. So if I go back here, watch when I refresh this on here. One has disappeared. Now notice ID 2 is kind of shuffled up because the IDs stay the same when we delete things. And that's quite an important uh, concept with relational databases because if they all shuffled up in value, then what previously was as a foreign key looking at the primary key on this one would change. So the primary keys cannot change in the table even when we delete things. So we actually get like holes in our database. Um, so let's go back over to uh, here. And what we can actually do is we can start to delete each one of these books one at a time. So if we change that value there to two, rerun it. Uh, we change that to three, rerun it. Change that to four and rerun it. You can see our list is getting shorter and shorter. If we go back to our browser and refresh that, you can see now we've got rid of quite a few books. But this could be quite tedious, getting rid of all the books one at a time. So we could probably put that in a loop. Um, if we had a range of values, we could we could put that into the loop as well and delete them one at a time. Or we could maybe present them a bit like this in a user interface. We'll have a go at creating a very basic user interface uh, in a minute. Uh, but that's how we delete individual records. But how about deleting the table itself, which is like a really dangerous thing to do. So let's have a look at how we would do that. So demo seven is dropping tables. So drop table is a very dangerous command, but we're going to have a go and do this right now. OK, let's get over to Keynote. And what we're going to do on here, let's go back over to, oops, to here. And we're going to change... Uh, the SQL statement, let's have a C. Why does that keep? All right, that's going to the wrong thing there, right. Uh, so what we're going to do is instead of delete books, we're going to say drop table, and then we're going to pass it the table name books. And that's all we're going to do. We don't need to do anything else. Let's get rid of all that. So let's just finish that command there. So we can actually comment that out for now. So we're simply going to just drop the table books. Um, and then let's see what happens with the rest. I'm going to just comment the rest of it out for now, actually. Let's just do that because it'll just generate an error. So we're simply going to connect to our database and then we're going to drop the table and that's it. So nothing else is going to happen now. So let's just run this. So nothing has happened. Let's have a see in our browser. If we now refresh this. Look, our books database has gone. Everything that was in it has gone. So that's quite a powerful command to, to run. Uh, it's not something we should do likely, uh, but it does mean that we can qu very quickly get rid of things and maybe recreate the table from scratch if we wanted to do that. Okay, so let's go back over to our demo. And we're going to now look at altering tables. So say we want to add or remove columns 
to our table. Uh, adding rows, we insert them, but adding or removing or changing columns, we use the alter command. Uh, so let's go back to our Visual Studio. Um, so instead of, we're going to use the employees table now, I think. So let's say alter table um, employees. Uh, and let's add column and let's call it um, uh, transport and that's going to be text. So they've got like a car or something like that. So if we now run this and we go back to our browsing tool, let's, let's find the employees. You can now see that we've got this transport column that's been added, but there's no values in anything because the values didn't exist when we created those records. So they've all got null in there because there isn't anything actually in there at the moment. So um, we would have to change an individual record. So I've not got a slide on changing individual records, but essentially instead of using the insert command, we use the update command. Um, so we can have a look at that, but let's, let's do something else next. Let's go back over to our keynote. And we're going to do the last demo, which is creating a very simple web user interface using Flask uh, and SQL Lite. So this is a nice, simple one for us to do. Uh, it says simple and then looks at the code on the other screen. Right, let's have a go at this. Let's just do a new file. Let's call this one um, web user interface.py. So, so from a Flask. So Flask is a framework for building web pages uh, using Python. So we're going to basically have render template. We're going to have a request and we're going to have redirect. And that's it. Uh, and we're then going to import SQLite as well. Now, the thing about Flask is we need to install that on our um, in our virtual environments. So what I've done before the show, I created a brand new virtual environment. And the way that I did this, I typed in Python 3 M V E M V V E M V. And if I run that, it will create a brand new virtual environment. I've actually got a virtual environment and I'm actually using it as we speak. So if we look there, there is this VNV folder uh, and I'm actually in it. I can see there where it's got the brackets. The way that you get in it is you type source uh, VAMV bin and activate and that will activate that particular environment. You can type deactivate to kind of get out of it. Deactivate. Like that. So we type it, we're back in there. And then if you do pip install flask, that will actually install the latest version of flask. I've already got it installed, so we're good to go. Okay, so we now need to create an app. We're just gonna call it app for now. We're gonna uh, have a database. Let's connect to my database and then let's create a get database connection so then we say um, connection or con equals sql light oops sql light connect database we can then do row factory don't worry about this this is just gonna this is just going to work trust me we're then going to have um, an app route this is the thing that will actually redirect any traffic that goes to the web server when we run this uh, to a particular function. So this function is called index. Uh, and what we're then going to do is retrieve some data from our, uh, so we're going to uh, retrieve an index.html and populate some information in there. So we're gonna to connect to our database using that function that we just created there. That's gonna return this connection. Uh, we're then going to, let's, we're going to use the books. We'll have to rerun our, our books code to make sure the books thing actually exists. Uh, and then we will close that connection. Uh, let's see what else we need to do. So we've, uh, we've fetched all and then we're, we are closing the connection. And then we're rendering the template that's called index.html and we're passing in books. Um, so this will all make sense in a minute. So the render template will essentially take an index that HTML that we're going to create and in there there'll be some curly braces that represent a variable and anything that we pass into that variable will be filled out in our template. So books is going to represent each of those rows that we've seen previously. So what we need to do now is um, do an app route which is add so we can add new books to our table. So we want to be able to do an add function. And let's do um, like title, oops, 
Let me just scroll up there. So we don't need any of that. Let me just don't do that. So let's do add. Call it add book. And we are going to say title equal not title title equals request dot form title. We're gonna have the author, we're gonna have the year. So request.form.get. Whenever you type something into a text field on our web user interface, that ID has a name and it gets passed back when you post um, the form to the web server. So that means we can grab those values and we can do things with it. And then we can basically just insert this into um, our, our database. We can say insert into books the title author using the values title author year, just like we've done on the other example. Uh, we're going to then commit that to the database and then close the database. And then we're going to return the redirect back to the default because what this slash add is like a special URL for adding books. OK, so what we then want to do is we basically just want to run this. So we don't need that uh, next one. Let's just do if name equals main. then run this which is app dot run debug equals true right now before i run that we do need to just go back and create that uh, that books table so let's just rerun this uh, i'm going to check in our in our database that that books table does exist and it has a couple of books in it, it hasn't got the books in it so i just need to insert them let's just run that again check that we have some books in there Yes, we do. Right. So let's now go back to this Python code and see what happens next. So let's go back to our web UE. OK, so it's now running a web server because Flask can do this and it's got a link for us to follow there. So I'm just going to click on the link and we haven't created the index HTML. So that's what we also need to do uh, because that's what it's complaining about there. So let me go back and create that. So the way that we do this is we have to create a folder that's called templates. And then inside templates, we need uh, an index to HTML. Now I've actually created one earlier, so we can just move this one in here. And let me just show you what this looks like. So um, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit so you can see this. And um, if you want to download the code and have a play with it, the link is in the description to this code as well. So this is HTML. We've got um, the book database is the title and we've got a style sheet there. So if there's a styles.css, it will link to it there. We then got a form. So this is where we have our title. We've got a text field. That's the title. Uh, we have an author and a year. And when we click that button, the action will be take post all this information to the URL slash add book. Now we've created an endpoint called add book that will take those three fields and then add them to our database. And then it will say, here's a book list. We've got title, author and year in the table. And remember when we had that books equal books, uh, this is where we have books equals books. So this will break out those individual variables uh, as field names. So if we now run our web UI, Again, let me just cancel that and rerun it. And then let's go back to over here and let's do refresh. It's not the prettiest, but it does actually work. So if we're going to add a new book, so, uh, so random fact, I wrote a book and published it on Amazon <laughs> and it's called Kev's Diet Sensation. Let's just say station. I think the book contains eight words. I was just trying to see like how you actually go about self-publishing and do they do any kind of uh, validation on that? And they absolutely don't. So I've no idea what year this was. It's probably about 2001 or something like that. If I click add book, ah, so add book, the URL was not found on the server. So what's happening there? That needs to be add book. Let me just update that and rerun. In fact, I think it's restarted. Let's just refresh that posted again and look at the very bottom there we've got Kev's Diet Sensation 2001 and then we can go back up here and add another book so let's call this one uh, 2001 by Arthur C. Clarke is it Clark with an E? I can't remember if it's with an E or not uh, and I, I can't remember what year it is, but let's just do 2001. And there we go, look, so we've got a web user interface with SQL Lite. If we go back to our DB browser and we go to our books and we refresh this, look, you've got Kev's Diet Sensation 2001. 
and you can see the year and the author as well so everything is connected together we've got that nice web user interface so i've managed to cram all that in in under an hour <laughs> i'm quite impressed that we managed to get through all that and build a flask web user interface as well so if you want to check out the course that goes along with this video if you head over to kesrobots.com slash learn slash sql light three slash you'll find the brand new course that i launched yesterday completely free uh, and it just teaches you about how to do exactly what we've done in today's video but a bit slower uh, and a bit more of the theory that goes in there as well we also have merch so alex has got the mug <laughs> there it is you've just been drinking out of this as well so we have the kev's robot mug as well i've also got some stickers that i'm lo looking to to um put on the store pretty soon as well so we've got some uh, nice um, kev's robots boobo stickers as well uh, I'm thinking about buying what, my uh, a Cree cut or something like that so I can uh, stick these on the store. I've got some Bubo Tutti merch as well. So check out the store and help support the show. And if you've not joined our Discord server, you are missing out. So if you head over to kevsrobots.com slash Discord, you can join the community of people there. You can get notified about videos and so on. And uh, you can also get help with any of the code. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm all over social media. So on threads, I'm at kevmackley at threads.net. Um, if you're not on threads, you need to jump on there while it's still just craziness and see uh, social media evolve. Um, on TikTok, I'm Kevin McAleer6. On Instagram, I'm Kevin McAleer. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at KevsMac. And on Mastodon Social, I'm at KevsMac at Mastodon.social. So give me a follow on there and say hi so I can uh, know who you are. And if you want to support the show, there's a whole number of different ways you can do this. If you're watching this um, on replay, you can hit the super thanks button. Uh, and that's, I think, on the bottom of the screen underneath the main player. There's a little thanks button. There is a super chat button. If you're watching this on the, uh, the live stream now, you can do a super chat. Let me make sure I've got all that switched on. Yes, I have. And you can also join the YouTube membership program as well uh, just by clicking the clicking the join button at the, the bottom of the browser as well. And if you also just want to get your name in the in the credits, um, you can go to kesrobots.com slash coffee and you can buy a coffee there, which will get your names in the credits. So very nice and very simple. So I do have a number of supporters I want to give a shout out to. Oops, why does it do this? <laughs> that, that should be a bit smaller. Let me just uh, adjust the size of this. Uh, how do I do that? There we go. <laughs> so this is like a, a little overlay movie that I have to uh, prepare at the beginning of each show. There we go. Right. So we have a number of supporters. We have a coffee from Tom. Uh, Roland bought a couple of coffees and so did Mike uh, Rakantha. We have a couple of members on the uh, Buy Me A Coffee site. So we have uh, Dean Corti, Marlene Brent, John Rank, uh, sorry, John Rank, Tom Shemi, Steve Phillips. And then YouTube members, we've got a new member. We have uh, Tinkering Rocks. Hey, Tinkering. We have uh, Cassie, who's on the chat at the moment. Hey, Cassie. We've got JDM, um, Johnny Bates. We have Bill Hoy, Oxrad39, Josie. We have Jeff Ford. We have Cheerlights, uh, Hands from Cheerlights. We have Michael. And of course, we have Tom. So thank you so much for supporting the show. It really does mean a lot to me. Uh, and we can just go back over to our keynote. And I think that's everything for the show today so this is the point in the video if you're watching this on replay i'll say thank you so much for watching and i shall see you next time